start up for today. Uh, my name is Chris Vitale. I think most of you were here uh, yesterday. I uh, just want to welcome you all again uh, and a few new faces here to uh, uh, Fernando Zalamea presenting on Grotendieck and the Theory of Contemporary Transgression. I uh, just want to thank the Media Studies Graduate Program at Pratt Institute and the New Center for uh, Research and Practice for helping to coordinate all of this uh, and to, you know, especially the New Center doing the live stream and Pratt for providing the location uh, thank you very much to everyone, and without further delay, Fernando Zalamea. Thank you very much, Chris. So, we will continue now uh, profiting from yesterday's uh, conceptual introduction to four of the main uh, gate uh, contributions by Gottendick uh, to mathematics, and what I will do today is to try to use those uh, mathematical inventions to have a, a general conceptual reflection about uh, a theory of culture that we will be applying in the next uh, two weeks. We are uh, in, the second, in our second session, in which I will more than philosophy, probably the good name would be like methodological outboards of uh, this work. And uh, we, I will try to explain that if we take seriously Grothendieck, then uh, we are uh, we can profit from uh, technical and conceptual mathematical tools in the change which is uh, coming from a few years uh, ago, in which uh, we the general perspective of culture is clearly changing from what what one what could. Uh, name uh, quickly and broadly analytical or postmodern to something that we would, would like to call synthetic and transmodern. So I will be doing a, a plea for a synthetic understanding of our world in our transmodern age using some of the mathematical ideas of Grothendieck to understand that uh, perspective. So we will be here. And uh, probably what will be more interesting afterwards will be the, the applications, the, the general cultural applications of this mathematical great conceptual revolution of Yotany to what is happening. For example, important movement, movements that are happening now in uh, general theory of culture, general theory of uh, the networks of the understanding of our web of uh, different images and the understanding of the world, the understanding of theory of music, a new art theory, and how these things can be related to the four main Latin inventions, shift, in top and motif. So don't worry too much if uh, last time I was uh, extremely quick, uh, we will be coming again on these uh, mathematical conceptual ideas, not on the technical things, so don't worry too much about the, the technical mathematics which are behind them. So this will be my talk today. I will be calling for some kind of synthetic philosophy against analytical philosophy, and particularly in I will explain the differences between them and uh, the oppositions, which are interesting. Uh, we, I will explain how, from Grothendieck's uh, ideas, we can get uh, new forces and new structures which can help to map a lot of the contradictions of our world in a structured way in which uh, the chaos doesn't. Is, is so chaotic, but there is a structure behind the differences. Uh, I will come back to the shifts again, which is our center for all the for all these talks. 
chiefs. Remember that uh, the great uh, foreign in the inventions by Grothendieck are related to chiefs. Chiefs are these conceptual mathematical objects which can help us to go from the local to the global, sometimes with good transits and sometimes with good obstructions. The obstructions are as important as the transits. And uh, there is a theory which tells us which tells us when we have the possibility of transit and when we will have to stop with, with a clear obstruction from going to the local to the global. So the categories of shifts where the fibers are abelian groups from the abelian categories of Grothendieck. This is the first, uh, first big uh, invention by Grothendieck in the 1957 article. Uh, the slides uh, are already available uh, at the web, uh, thanks to Christopher. And if you put them last night, uh, you can get the, the, the exact uh, slides. And then you have the exact dates and the articles uh, on which Grothendieck invented all of these uh, great uh, mathematical ideas, which I am synthes synthesizing very shortly. So, SIFS was the first one. The skills then were some kind of shifts. Shifts where there is an algebraic flavor, and that algebraic flavor is the simplest one, the simplest possible one, in which the fibers are modules, and the modules are of finite type, finitely generated, and the translations, the horizontal translations, have kernels which are also of finite type. So these are schemes. And when you have uh, some of the fibers which are uh, simple rings uh, which come from prime ideas, remember that that was a generalization of point, then you are in the, in the categories of schemes. If you take not only one shift, but all shifts together, then you get a category of all shifts over some kinds of topologies which are finer than the usual topologies, and these finer topologies give you the Grothendieck topologies, which is the third grade in the invention. And the fourth one are the motifs in which he, he tried to find, and it is work uh, going around, he tried to find out uh, like the archetypes for the homologies. We will combat them to shifts, to center where shifts are everywhere, is one of the models of these uh, talks. And I will profit from shifts to, to have like a, a reflection of what is happening in the analytic, both in the analytical and the synthetical sense of what is the meaning of the shift. And then we will go to, to transits. Yesterday I was asked to, do, to give a, a definition of transit, and you will see in this talk and in, same, in several talks afterwards that I will be very personal in that sense. Instead of giving a precise definition of transit, I will profit from the vague idea of transit, which is very interesting, and which can be defined contextually depending on the context you can define transit. In a category, in another category, in a mathematical setting, you can define transits by use. In that sense, I will be pragmatic, but in, in the sense of uh, versus pragmaticism that I will explain here, and that next time uh, I will go deeper on that. In which you have some object, and the object is not well defined, but the representations are then well defined. So let's begin with talking against analytical philosophy. Uh, harsh words against analytical philosophy, particularly when analytical philosophy talks about mathematics. It's very simple, in fact. All the things that I am saying are extremely simple. Analytical philosophy never talks about mathematics. Never. Analytical philosophy talks about logic, about set theory, about numbers. Look for a good article or for a good uh, monograph of analytical philosophy of mathematics where the names of Galois, Riemann, Poincaré, Hilbert are named. They never appear. Never. Yesterday we were saying that uh, the basic mathematics begins uh, with Galois and Riemann, 
the basic model mathematics between but one Riemann it's, it is a fact and uh, still today most of the most profound mathematics are trying to understand the great ideas of Galois and Riemann and to connect them in several ways. So analytical philosophy was very interesting and very useful for a moment of the development of the 20th century to understand the logic and the set theory of mathematics. But real mathematics, uh, Chris was telling me yesterday about that, that adjective, real mathematics has to do with very different things, with algebra, with topology, with uh, differential equations, with geometry, that never appears in a good replies of analytical philosophy. It's like mathematics disappears completely. That's something very strange, because the analytical philosophy in the beginning was created by the great, by the, by the great Russell, who was a very good mathematician, and knew very well mathematics. But afterwards, I don't know why, the successors of, of the, the analytical tradition forgot completely about mathematics, except there was a very interesting comeback here in the American Counter tradition, I would say probably, with uh, Rota in MIT. Probably you have heard about him, one of the very interesting philosophers of mathematics uh, of the end of the 20th century. Rota uh, wrote a very beautiful article explaining why this contradiction, how in fact analytical philosophy uh, was initiated by people who knew very much mathematics, but afterwards, and the, the analytical philosophers uh, worked on their own in their very nicely and closed uh, architecture, and mathematics disappeared completely, particularly the most important things in mathematics, which are geometry, algebra, topology, things like that, never appeared again. So, the 20th century was very much uh, informed about set theory and logic, but not all logics, particularly first order classical logic, which is strong influence on analytical philosophy. And with a strong uh, uh, sense of, uh, of a program to develop, a program well developed, extremely well developed, but I think which has come now come to an end. <laughs> there is little that uh, the analytical philosophy can say now about mathematics. Uh, the understanding of an object internally, the composing the, the, the object, looking at the positive aspects of the object, doing like a certification and a purification, there was the sense that uh, things should be clear enough and pure and well is different and uh, there should be clear walls between things, and uh, you shouldn't contaminate things. And yesterday, the contamination word came about. Analytical philosophy has uh, some sense of an horror, or, or really horror about contamination. But mathematics is contamination everywhere, I would say. You cannot understand mathematics, or you cannot understand rotundity without complete contamination of the different regions of mathematics. And modern and particularly contemporary mathematics is not just a study of little things of algebra, of little things of differential equations, or small things in topology, but it's important when they are combined. All the important work in mathematics in the 20th century is a combination of a lot of things, set theory and logic certainly, but also topology, algebra, geometry, differential equations, functional analysis, etc. All of these together. This is Grothendieck. Grothendieck was a particularly important mathematic, mathematician in which all of the regions of mathematics were in his mind. And he was always working in the combination of them. One could say in the very fruitful contamination of them. If you contaminate topology with algebra, then you get algebraic topology. Things very, very interesting and very important. If you just do small little things in algebra, probably you will not be a great mathematician. All the, all the fields medalists, in fact, 
are not uh, just uh, specialists in one special in one part of mathematics. They always apply different methods from different fields to combine with, uh, with new things. This was very close to Hilbert's theory. The idea of Hilbert, which was very important, very fruitful, but also which uh, came to, to, to some kind of examination in one, in one moment, in which there was a beautiful idea that the mathematics should grow from very precise roots, and the roots should be strong enough that the tree will be developed forever and will be very clear and consistent. You know that that program was was limited, not finished, limited by Gödel's theorem. The, 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 the completeness theorem of Gödel says that if you have a theory which is strong enough to have in, inside of, of it and the theory of numbers, the, the arithmetic, that theory will be incomplete. So in this sense, the precise statement is if you have a theory with consensual arithmetic, if that theory is consistent, then the theory cannot show its consistency. It cannot do its consistency. So there are, there are things which are behind it. In particular, with the theory. The theory is a, it's a very good example of an, of an incomplete theory. It contains arithmetic. You cannot show the consistency of the theory. In fact, the only thing that we could show, perhaps, we don't know. We know for certain that if set theory is consistent, it will never be proved consistent with the means of set theory. It will be proved consistent with other means, with the larger cardinals and things like that, with rotomic universes, which things which are in a layer, in a tower, in which you have you can protect the big cardinal on the smallest parts of the of the set theory. That you can do. But the the Large cardinals cannot be proved from, from the from the set theory. They, they are additional hypotheses, additional actions, which lie well uh, beyond set theory. So we know for certain that set theory will not be able to prove its consistency. But we don't know, but it could be perhaps true, that set theory will prove its inconsistency. Perhaps set theory in one moment of the development of civilization as mathematics, will be able to prove its inconsistency. For the moment, it, it hasn't been possible. But there are very good, very serious mathematicians trying to prove that set theory is inconsistent. For example, Edward Nelson at Princeton, he, he, has, he has a large program to prove the inconsistency of, of set theory. Uh, he has been working on that for 30 years. And there are people who are close to him and things like that. And he, in fact, uh, some years ago, he, he announced that he had proved inconsistency. There was a big row in mathematics, but uh, finally the proof was not correct. Okay. But uh, it could be done. There is no, no reason why it could. I think for that, he passed away, Nelson passed away. But only weeks ago, this is a very interesting story, his proof of inconsistency of piano arithmetic was proved to be false very quickly, like very foul. Yes. Very bad condition. A new version of it, also was passed away now, was posted by his wife with, wait, sorry, wait, now with, uh, with, uh, an afterward by Terry Powell, it's all in the archive. Okay, thank you very much. Terry Tao still thinks there's a flaw in it. Yes. Pro problem? But, no, but even with a fixed version. Okay. So Nelson fixed the Fix version. Fixed the Tao. Okay. In his afterward, Tao still thinks there's a flaw. Uh -huh. But, uh... Okay, <laughs> but that, that's extremely interesting. Those are things which, in some in some moment, perhaps Nelson would, would be... are checking it right yes. now. So, you know, maybe, maybe he yeah. actually succeeded. <laughs> maybe. It would be fantastic I, I for him. Yes, I, I think with uh, all, all, mathe all mathematicians doubt, that, doubt it because uh, if the, the history is long, it's very strange that it could be an inconsistency, but there is no logical uh, reason why it should be. Can I just say one more thing? Yes, please. I, I know you're doing um, 
I'm sorry, you encourage questions, right? Yes, please. Okay, all right. It's okay, right? I mean, it's um, I think you're being slightly unfair to analytical also, okay? In the following sense. And I know, so, I know. I know, and I know you know. Yes. <laughs> and then this is a rough historical schedule, yeah. obviously. You know, history needs caricature in order to proceed, yes. of course. But, I mean, in one sense, right? The distinction is between the foundation of mathematics and practice. That's it. So analytic philosophers didn't say forget about mathematics. They just said, okay, we care about the foundation of knowledge, and we're going to look at the foundation of mathematics. You know? but, 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 that's true, but you know, the methods, not the cutting edge methods. That, that's true, but saying, but by doing that, in fact, they forgot about mathematics it's completely. True. It's true. Yeah. But it, it's nothing new, right? I mean, Kant, it's nothing. It's Kant nothing. Kant didn't new. imitate Newton's methods. You know, he asked. What is it that makes mathematical knowledge certain? And once yeah. you figured it out, you stop looking at what Leibniz or you guys were doing, you just develop this theory, right? Yeah. So I think it's equally sort of question making what you suggest, which is fascinating, no doubt, okay. is to imitate the method, imitate the cutting edge methods of mathematics mm -hmm. into it. Yes. Right? yes. So it's, it's, I, I, I will be coming on, on that uh, today. So I, I am beginning to be harsh against analytical <laughs> philosophy to be uh, to, to produce the caricature, but then afterwards I will try to begin to, to produce the pendulum between the two. Okay, it's important. But one thing which is clear is that if you are inserted in this line, you don't see the your your vision is limited. So there, there should be at least a counterpart. And with that counterpart you should begin like. But this should be developed also with time. And then uh, the, the, the contraposition is simple enough. Instead of looking at set theory internally, look at category theory externally, instead of looking at classical logic, instead of look at the logic of this, which are the intermediate logic between intuitionism and the classical logic. So here you have a lot of uh, very interesting logics which here disappear. And here you have then, and this is a name that uh, simply makes the counterpart, if you have any name that the filter will tell. But instead of looking inside, you look to the trans, the trans, transit, transmodern that I will be interested in today a lot of times. The composition, instead of the composition, the actions for the compositions are certainly much harder than the actions for composition. So, from the philosophical point of view, this is very interesting. The set theoretic actions are not at all clear. The category theoretic actions are completely trivial. So, there are very important philosophical differences between them. The negativity is particularly interesting in this way, in this perspective. The, 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 all, the, all of the many trends of contemporary mathematics, non, non computer geometry, non linearity, non separation, the, the third and the studies I was talking about yesterday. And the name contamination corresponds to this idea. Instead of having a well defined structure with, with its borders, you make small changes around the borders, you make Transformations, epsilon transformations are of the borders. You quantize the structure in some sense. Instead of having a well defined tree, you will have something which Lomov, one of the greatest uh, geometers uh, living, uh, calls the, the cloud. You don't have a very well defined tree, you have a cloud with a lot of dense. Dense apparitions, dense apparition around number, dense apparition around our own group, dense apparition about uh, linear differential equations, and all densities are together like fighting all the time together. There should be some, this is not uh, completely correct, it was more close to language, it should be more close to some kind of imagination, of visual imagination. That is true for categories. In categories, you have uh, all the time di 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 diagrammatic imagination, which is very interesting going on there. For example, things like this uh, negativity, you have uh, 
the construction of uh, non-standard analysis, which uh, very simple ideas of uh, first order classical logic. You take uh, models uh, for the reals in which you have a point and infinity. It's very easy to use the model with that with the compactness theorem. And then you take the inverse of the point and infinity, then you get the decimals, and then you get a very simple synthetic and calculus uh, differential geometry calculus, which is very far from the very clear epsilon delta positivity imagination and left, etc. Et I will come back on this several times. Some of the ideas which come directly from Grotten. This is one and very important, I think. The idea of a relative universe. In principle, this seems like a contradiction. The universe shouldn't be relative. The universe should be absolute. But this is what we were talking about that yesterday that after Gellert, it is clear that the absolute will not appear anymore in mathematics. All proofs will be relative. One model against another model and how they behave together. This is the relative consistency of one theory with respect to another. How the models are well patched together in order to get a new model, the compactness theory. How models go back and forth on cardinals, the going on scholar theorem. Things like that produce a structure of models. The data structure is, is, is a structure of correlations between models. And the relations between the models are the important things. They do not live in an absolute set theory or in an absolute, uh, I don't know, whatever mathematics, uh, platonism that we want to expect. We have correlations of the time. So the idea of universal non-absolute relative universal is it is possible? Category theory says that yes, it is completely possible. You have a lot of categories, differential categories, different contexts. For example, a topological category and algebraic category. Whatever you want, you have complete regions of mathematics. And the theory of categories has been able to show that many of these constructions, certainly the most important constructions in topology, in algebra, in functional analysis, in logic, all come from universal definitions, independent of the region. So you can define here in abstract categories. You're only, only using the properties of, of the morphic objects which incarnate in different things in complete categories. So even if these things seem different, in fact, in many cases, they come from a known origin which is a very well defined. Here, we have very well defined uh, objects in mathematics. This is completely theoretic part of uh, Topology, algebra, functional analysis. Here in abstract categories, you have only the actions of categories, the associativity of the composition, the identities. Then you define how you go from one category to another to functors. Then you define how you go from functors to functors and natural transformations like this. Here you have a category, an object. The object is represented to the outside. Then you have another category. You have a transit between them, and then you have a transit between functors. These things are completely well defined here. And here we have good universal definitions by a great discovery of the, of the people in category theory in the 60s, uh, before Rotterdam, uh, theory of categories in, uh, appeared in 1945 uh, with McLean and Eisenberg here in, in New York, in Columbia University. And, uh, but they were used at the beginning as a tool, as a language to simplify difficult calculations in algebraic topology. And really, the, the development of the category theory comes with uh, the, the, the whole group by Grotendieck, as Matlein explicitly said. 
Here you have the definitions are given by a very simple and universal quantifier. Exists unique. Exists unique. It's a different quantifier than the, the usual quantifier that we have in mathematics. The, the usual quantifiers are like uh, these things which are extremely harsh. You take everything or you take a point instead. Having this is a much more interesting quantifier. This is unique. The object is characterized, completely characterized by his behavior in the context. So you can do universal definitions in abstract categories which incarnate in very concrete objects. For example, what is called here uh, uh, an initial object. From an object, you get a unique morphism to any other object of the category. That's a very simple idea. Something like an empty set. Empty set is included in any other set. So take a general initial object in which you have only one way, only one way of including him in any other object of the category. That's called an initial object. So this is a definition, a universal definition in abstract categories. In set theories, you get the empty set. In uh, topology, you get the discrete topology. In uh, partially ordered set, you get the minimum. In, uh, in the category of uh, commutative rings, uh, you get the Z, etc. So you get a lot of, of differences here are coming from a universal definition. So we can perfectly talk in, in category theory about relative universals. This is something that, that I think is very important. Is not well, well known, and uh, universals are far from being dead. Um, I'm curious, I don't know if this relates or not. Um, the contextual quantifier, uh, are you thinking about the quantifier of the 20th century? Yes. The 21st century is more related to set theory. Yes. Yeah. Stuff, but I know more recent other logics you know, develop kind of different sorts of. Yes. 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 There will be relations. I will be coming on that afterwards. Uh, remember me and you when I will, when we will be talking about topos again. In any topos, you can define model, model operations. And with those model operations, you are generalizing the usual model connectors. So, in any, in any logarithmic topos, you can have model operations. Mm -hmm. So, this idea, which is a, a, an idea of, of the, both the, the American school and the French school, which were found in the theory of categories in the 50s and the 60s, this idea is represented by the concept of a relative universal. In fact, I think that this diagram and this diagram are very close together. The diagram the upper part is first. It's not the diagram that first did, but this is the pragmatic theory of first, in which you have a sign, general sign. The sign is interpreted in different contexts, and in each context you have a different representation of the sign. And what 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 you, what you will know about the sign is the, 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 the how the sign the representation of the sign behaves in the given context. If you change the context, the action and reaction of the, the representation will be different. In another context, it will be different, etc. So you can have the idea of uh, universal semiotics here. It was first. First, had the idea of a universal semiotics in which the different representations give relative information about the original sign. And what was the meaning for, uh, of the sign for first? This meaning, what is the meaning of this sign? The meaning of this sign is the integral of all these different representations. Here you have like the sign, it is represented in a differential way here, in a different way here, in a different way here. It behaves differently. We can compare them. Here you have like a differentiation, and then you integrate on all of them 
then you get the sign. So the, the pragmatic season theory by first is like a differential and integral party of a semiotic nature. This is also a differential and integral party. So you have all different frameworks of mathematics, they are integrated in the notion of the abstract category. So these things can be are, are very close. In fact, the pragmatism of first holding signs and representations. Our shift theory trying to glue whatever local information you have in the global one. Or you can integrate the complete and the abstract. This is completely mathematical, well developed. Yeah, I, I very shortly explained uh, yesterday some of the mathematics involved. But then all of this is completely theoretical. This is not theoretical. But it is becoming, it is, it is starting to be mathematized. Uh, the, continu the continuity which is behind this can be a little mathematized. And the, the, the pragmatic maxim also can be, uh, we are working on that, can be uh, uh, formalized in the context of theory of categories. So the, there is a simple, in a simple uh, statement some kind of strong life for relative universe. They are alive. So when postmodernism 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 says that universals are dead, we are completely in disagreement with that. They are changing. They are changing. There is something beautiful in Spanish, I think it's the only language that has this. There is a fundamental duality between reason and heart. And then the beautiful and famous, uh, one of the famous and most beautiful trade sentences of or philosophy and literature is Pascal. Le cœur a des raisons que la raison ne connaît pas. The heart has its reasons that reason does not know nothing about. This famous phrase says that if there is a fundamental duality between reason and heart, between sensibility and sensibility, which is uh, one of the great uh, contradictions and dualities of Kant's uh, Kant system. But in Spanish, it is said by a, by a true duality. It's the only language in which this is reason and this is heart, corazón. Corazón is the heart, and this is the reason. This is a very strange and very beautiful thing. You have a true Galois connection, a true duality, a true adjunction between heart and reason. Of course, this is the example. Is the main example of, of the gigantic heart and the gigantic reason. Very, very important for him is heart. Uh, probably you have read his record to semi, his great treatise of 1500 1, pages, in which he talks about the inventivity in mathematics, creativity in mathematics. It is in French, I think it, it has been good translated. It's a very, very beautiful text in which he explains how uh, the inventivity in mathematics needs a great heart combined with the reason. I'm going back and forth between the two. I will explain this a little bit more afterwards. With my languages, we have types against archetypes. The types are the different regions in which Grothendieck produced his great theory. The great theorems about complex variables using ships, the, the extension of Riemann rock. We were talking about yesterday about Riemann rock, one of the cent centerpieces of mathematics. That is what we, what we will call real mathematics. That has nothing to do with set theory, with logic, with foundations, but that is real mathematics. Where you have all the blends between arithmetic, geometry, algebra, differential equations. That is in the very heart of mathematics. Certainly what is not in the heart of mathematics, even if it's extremely interesting, I am a logician, so I am working against me. The modern logics, for example, are extremely interesting, but 
completely uninteresting for the for the real mathematician. The real mathematician is interested in this complex variety, differential equation, polynomial, algebra, Riemann rocks. Riemann rocks is really the hard of mathematics. I would I would uh, even go further. If the heart is complex variable, the opposite of the heart in mathematics is logic. I am a logician, so don't worry about it. I, I, I know about my limitations. I know about the limitations of logic. Logic has a strong limitations. La raison, the terre de raison, que la raison ne connaît pas. There are reasons here in the heart, in the complex variable, in the Riemann rock, important mathematics. Which are completely ununderstandable for them and for it in general. Other important uh, approaches by, by Grotendi go directly to the heart of mathematics, the real heart of mathematics, to reconstruct with the schemes. Remember what he did with the schemes? It was the first deep reconstruction of Galois and Riemann together to take. The general idea of the commutative rings of Meromorgan functions by Riemann, or the general idea of the commutative ring of algebraic integrals by Bagalo and Dedekind, and to put them together in the notion of scheme. That's the heart of mathematics. This is also the heart of mathematics, topos, the topology. Can't you, but you can formalize complex analysis in terms of exactly. Certainly, you can you can formalize, but you cannot do. You cannot. If you are doing complex analysis, you will be using some parts of the of the set theory, but very very little of them, extremely very little. To formalize them in some in some place, it doesn't mean that you are doing the the mathematics in that sense. I am certain if you are a complex viable uh, theory uh, specialist for the geometer, that you will never. Be interested in Aleph three or Aleph seven? Sure. Never, never. It's a, it's a theory is useful to formalize to give us like the illusion. It is not more than an illusion that we are consistent. It's just an illusion because you will never be able to prove the consistency of that theory. It's just an illusion. Well, when you are doing complex variable, you when you are doing, I have done it a lot of times. When you are doing the proof of, of Cauchy theorem, you will never use that theorem, never. Okay. okay. But the point, but I think you're drawn too far a distinction here, right? Because I mean, I think in some sense you're underestimating the power of the foundations can have, right? Because at least no, I, 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 yes. okay. Do. Okay. I, I am going. I am. I am or going. I, I am going. I am going. I am. I am being harsh. In purpose, of course, since I am saying that I am also a logician, I, I, I don't underestimate, but I, I am saying that we have overestimated too much the theory. Too much overestimation of the theory. Mathematicians are not at all interested in the theory. They are interested in their complex variable, in their analysis, in their topology, in their algebra, not at all about the theory. We have to be careful about that because we have overestimated too much the theory, and particularly in what we are talking here, which is the philosophy of mathematics. We are looking to a philosophy of mathematics in which set theory says nothing anymore. It is not saying anything new. We have to be harsh on that, <laughs> but we will, we will have all these times to talk about that. This, this is real mathematics. Uh, cl clearly, Aleph, the, the, the things about the, the consistency uh, that uh, great, great mathematicians that I love a lot, Shela. For me, Shela is, for example, the, 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 the example of the greatest mathematician life, the great logician, in which he, he is doing very wonderful mathematics, but uh, is, it is clear that Shela has no impact whatsoever. In the, in the real life of the mathematician. That's a fact. This, this person is, instead has, has had a lot of influence on the, the real life of mathematicians. Example, uh, all of these are, are things, of course, to, to discuss and to have a dialogue and to, to 
power contradictions and these medals. The field medals. The panorama of field medals is a good, it's not perfect, but it's a good representation of what mathematics is about. There has been only one field medalist in logic. He was Cohen, and Cohen was an analyst, a theorist, a number theorist. So, some, we, we, we should be aware that in the philosophy of mathematics, the overestimation of logic and the overestimation of the theory has done a lot of wrongs. Has done a lot of wrongs. Well, these things that Grothendieck worked uh, very much inside, he was a strong mathematician looking at the heart of mathematics. Reconstructing homology, reconstructing the general idea of topology. These things, if you go to the reason of the reconstruction of them, are all of them related to an occasion. Non commutativity is the way in which uh, Grothendieck generalized the Riemann drop. Theorem. The Riemann Roch theorem said that there was a connection between the genus of the surface and the harmonic dimension be, the, between the, the vector space of the holomorphics and the vector space of the meromorphics. That equation can be reconstructed as a non commutative diagram related to his K group, K theorem. And this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, these kinds of, of ideas. In topos, there shouldn't be points. In general toposes, there shouldn't be our usual points. Our usual points which are atoms. In general, uh, when we will change our topos, the logic will change. There is something really important in the topos which says how the logic changes is the subject classifier. So object classifier changes its uh, form, its modality, if you want. It changes its modality, and inside of the subject classifier, the terminal object, which in which you produce points, usually you produce, you produce points like uh, in, in category in, in this way. The point is just a narrow expressed in this way. This is a point. This is an, an atom in the lattice, okay? The lattice in the Boolean algebra lattice. So in general, this thing will change in top of it. It will not be represented by a point. It will be something more general. It can be a generic uh, terminal object with a lot of information. And there will be toposes without points, something very interesting. Toposes in which the classical logic doesn't work at all, and then you have some non quality which appears. The non multiplicity of cohomologies. The idea that behind all differential cohomologies there should be a motive which is projected in each of them. There are a lot of negations here, and in fact, this is related to what uh, is for me one of the most beautiful definitions of mathematics. Would be. We have a lot of possible definitions of mathematics. Uh, one of them would be something like this. Mathematics is the exact study of the borders of negation. The exact study of the borders of negation. There are a lot of other definitions. Mathematics is the study of number and space. But this is uh, something which is interesting because it goes through, through the whole possibility. The, the, the exact study of the borders of negation. Take, for example, Galois again. Galois is always like uh, the paradigm of mathematics, of real, of real conceptual important mathematics. How do you get uh, uh, Galois? Remember, it was a very simple idea. You have your base, then you want to take the solutions of the equation, you put them together in a field, then you look whatever transformation you have between those solutions. Those are invisible from the base, those invisibilities from the, the Galois group. And with the Galois group, what the Galois did 
was to find the exact conditions for which the equation was solvable or not by radicals. So there is a the first time in the, in the history of mathematics in which some subtractions are taken to be the definitions of an important object, and that object helps to understand us when something cannot be done. It cannot be done. Well, uh, other, other important examples are Poincaré, for example, we were talking about him yesterday, also in the heart of mathematics, and the homology versus the homotopy associated to the space. If you take the homology of the sphere or the homotopy of the sphere, the homology of the sphere will not characterize the sphere. The homotopy perhaps will characterize the sphere. There is a non possibility there, which is a theorem. There are a lot of those which are extremely important, of course, by the, the incompleteness theorem. Well, and, uh, and there is something even more beautiful, uh, you know, about that. If not, it's one of the best, more beautiful theorems of the, of the 60s, the theorem by Lovier. And it's uh, William Lovier, which is uh, probably the, the greatest uh, category theorist alive. And he was uh, a student of Eilenberg here in Colombia. Lovier uh, invented, discovered, in fact, we will talk a little about invention and discovery in a moment, discovered uh, a very beautiful theorem which is called the, the diagonal argument in which he shows that Cantor's theorem, Cantor's theorem is the, the development of set theory. If you have a set and you take the subset, the, the, the set of all subsets, the cardinal will be greater than the given set of the beginning. The Cantor's theorem, this will provide the development of all set theory of the great uh, development of set theory. Cantor's theorem, better theorem, Completeness theorem. The Tarski theorem about uh, if you have a complete lattices and the, then you have a function between complete lattices, they will have a fixed point. Uh, the Brouwer theorem and topology for fixed points. All of these, which in different things, Cantor, Bell, Brouwer, Tarski, all of these are coming from an archetype, archetype theorem. So all of these will be examples, particular examples. That is the diagonal argument of, of, uh, of Lovier. And the key of the diagonal argument of Lovier is a very simple idea again, but very, very powerful, is that the negation doesn't have fixed points. The negation sends true to false, and false to true, but no fixed, no fixed points for the negation. See, since you don't have fixed points, fixed points for the negation, and you use the negation in order to construct your mathematical objects, then the mathematical objects will grow. If you go back to the proof of Cantor's theorem, you will see how the, the proof is constructed. It, it is about a negation. The negation is in the middle of the proof. And what uh, Lovier discovered is that the universe grows precisely and theoretically because there is a negation. If, if, there would, if there wasn't a negation, there wouldn't be a development of the universe. So this is a very nice uh, theorem in which you can see that mathematics is in fact the, story, the exact study of the borders of negation. Let's come back again to Grotten. Some inversions. Grothendieck helps always to think differently. This is for me very important, to think differently. Grothendieck thinks in his own way. I was explaining yesterday why, because he was extremely original. He never read mathematics. He listened a lot of mathematics. He talked a lot of mathematics. He used not to read mathematics in purpose, because the originality would be hindered if not. He develops his own way. He was always very original, very creative. His book, Recorte Semai on Creativity, I recommend it a lot. 
So a lot of inversions, a lot of different ways of thinking about uh, our objects. So one of one of the first is against our usual ideals. We have a good idea, good idea over there, a nice idea, idea, but but which is completely false, false idea, is that the number is constructed by units. One, one plus one. One plus one plus one, one plus one plus one. That goes very well in a hundred, one thousand, but take two to the power of one hundred. That's that's a number. And there are no units there. Clearly there are no units there, no real units. Because there are no enough atoms in the universe to produce that number. So that's a complete ideal. It's a beautiful idea, it's a false idea. Real life doesn't have to be anything related to units. Real life is more related to something more strange, which is some kind of under and under under estimated or not well understood continuity. There is some continuity around the world. Here I am being very patient also. First, the main idea of course was, was that the cosmos was continuous. And the race of continuity in the cosmos produced the, its development. So the, there shouldn't be units in number, in fact. The, this idea, one and one, is very beautiful, but it's, it's, a, it's a construction of our mind. It's not there. It's a construction of our mind. Because if you take already a, a good quantity of, of units, you will never get no, anything matters. There is a beautiful uh, sentence by Tarkovsky, the great uh, filmmaker. A plane and another plane do not form two planes, not even a third dramatic plane. They escort in time a longer plane. This idea is very authentic. To, to escort in time, to produce in time, something continues. One plus one will not be two. One plus one will be something different. How can that be done? And you have a question? Come so, so, in what way is any part of mathematics not just a construction of our minds? I mean, you know, you're saying, okay, well, you know, uh, something like, you know, Graham's number or whatever is uh, going to be something that doesn't exist in the physical universe. Yes. Right? But in what sense does anything, any kind of mathematical object we have exist in Okay, all, all of mathematics is ideal. Okay, we, are, we agree with that. In particular, units and numbers, they are ideal. Mm -hmm. Okay, sure. sure. We agree with that. Completely, I agree completely with that. It's an ideal, it's an ideal world which is related to go back and forth with our reality. I just, I feel I've lost when you say this, especially, now that could you clarify what exactly the distinction between abstract and concrete? Abstract and concrete, yes. It's very simple here. Abstract and concrete, I am going back to, to the category theoretic, theoretic framework. The concrete are the concrete regions of mathematics. For us, right. concrete regions of mathematics, the category of topological spaces, the category of community rings, the category of shifts, the category of coherent shifts. These are completely these are completely yeah. ideal, yes, but there is a different level in abstraction. There is a different level. Yeah. Here you have roots for all this these that ideal yeah. This all of these are concrete but not real. But but there, there are there are a lot of layers in our in our ideality. So it would be fair to summarize your view as there is nothing actually concrete, but there are different gradations of abstraction. Yes, yes, yes. Levels, levels, layers. Yes, level and layers completely fundamental here. But not concrete. The name concrete is the, the technical name. A concrete category is something which has a prompter on a, on a, on a sub, sub category of subterra. That's a method. 
Oh, no, 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 Category, Avenian categories are instances of general abstract categories that are layers. There are a lot of layers. Yeah, so it is like a same thing. If you're familiar with the model theory, it's the same thing. No, it's not, it's, not, it's not true. It's not true. It's not syntax and semantics again. No, it's pragmatics. It's very different. It's the third one. Not syntax, not semantics, but pragmatics. Which is, this is what I am saying. That is not equivalent to category. Ah, oh, well, but that, that's uh, just uh, the play of a logician. Just to clarify, so you, you mean concrete category in the actual strict sense of the word, where there's a forgetful functor from yeah. these categories to the category yes. of sets? Yes, yes. Okay. That's, the, that's, the, that's the, the technical definition. Okay. And that corresponds to regions of mathematics. So this could be the similar diagram, how all these things separate. By the way, I'm not, I'm not disagreeing with that. I'm just trying to get clear on your view. Okay, great. I, I, but you think, you think this is unhelpful? Uh, no, no, it's, it's, it's good, but I am saying that, that you're forgetting the third one. You are saying that this is syntax and semantics. No, this is more pragmatic than syntax and semantics. Like the third. The third, the third dimension is the, the important one for us here. We are going beyond syntax and semantics, and we are getting to the pragmatics. Yes, the third, the third uh, the dimension of semiotics. I just look the difference. The difference the way I see it is when you do something, when you accidentally do something in a computing category, yeah. the objects you're interested in are defined synthetically in some sense. You're yes. not interested in the abelian category yes. itself. You're interested in the objects that any model of that theory will have. Okay. If you want to study them as if they were groups. Yes. Yes. Uh, yes. Right. The model theory right, way of thinking is you actually have one specific structure. Or something less complicated. But in my view, which I think you disagree with, these aren't really, there's no fundamental difference in this way of thinking. It's just different ways of approaching the same kind of object. I think they, they produce. Axiomatizing a group by axiomatizing a collection of whole groups, or axiomatizing a group. I, I think they produce different philosophical perspectives and different philosophical problems. Well, this is where I, I am going to, to point. Huh? This is the, 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 the general idea of this seminar is, going, is to see how these mathematical ideas can be applied outside mathematics. So in that sense, we will have to do a little methodology and philosophy. And the methodology and philosophy of uh, Grothendieck and of Perth cannot be reduced to syntax and semantics. This is what I am saying. So this is the, the way that uh, things usually are presented to us. From naturals, what we integer, to rationals, to reals, to complexes, to shift sections. So the idea following your lead also is, instead of going this way, take seriously the category of all abelian shifts, where the, shift, where the fibers are abelian groups. That's a category, that's a, the, the abelian category that our colleague here is speaking about. There are actions about them. 
and work out with these actions and come back again. Inverse the process. Go from the continuous to the discrete. Instead of going to the, from the discrete to the continuous, go the other way around. It changes completely the way of understanding mathematics, the way of understanding philosophy in particular. That's my point. And also, in, in all of the all of the examples we good uh, understanding of people who talked about this before uh, before uh, the example Valerie we will be, be coming in, in, in one of the sessions afterwards on Valerie and the idea of Valerie my first look the limit no long time no simultaneous time it seems like a playing of words but essentially he's saying that points in time are inexistent you don't have a point you have limiting points in time. You have neighborhoods. So the idea of a point is a completely different idealization. And that is a fact uh, even in, uh, as, as we teach. We have never, and I, 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 I emphasize that, we have never seen a point. Never. And we will never see a point. When I say this is a point, I am saying something completely false. This is not the point. This is a neighborhood, a wide neighborhood of the black or whatever. We, when we are in the real life, we talk all the time about neighborhoods. And we have this beautiful idea by Cantor that if you have a lot of neighborhoods, they will converge in the point. But that's, a, that's an idealization, a complete idealization. In the real world, you will never have points. We can, we are all the time talking about points in the space. We only have neighborhoods, real neighborhoods. And the thing goes exactly in the inverse way. We are talking about points, that points come from lines, the lines come from planes, all these lines, this construction. But in fact, things should be inverse. When we have a good understanding of the shift, then we will be able to reconstruct the point. It's a different approach. This is what this inversion is very important because it changes completely our way of, of looking at uh, the basic objects in mathematics. We have something which is non-analytic here, which is essentially synthetic here and analytic here, which is essentially non-classical here classical here, so things are completely changed around. And uh, if, this wish, if this is interesting, I, I, I am not saying that this is the right view of things and this is the wrong view of things, no. I am saying that there are different views. And those different views are very important. And we should compare them. They should help us to understand things. In particular, they should help us to understand our Temporary work. This is, this is my main uh, objective in the next few weeks. How to apply this to understand our culture today? I think that it helps a lot to think continuously, synthetically, pragmatically, categorically against the opposites, which have been useful but which have done their way. This one is also important. No disjunction in form. We will be going to Florensky afterwards in one of the posterior uh, sessions of, of the seminar. Florensky is a beautiful person, a great thinker. He was one of the, these universes in which uh, you have all the things at the same time. He was a mathematician, but he was an art critic. He was a philosopher and a scientist. Uh, great universal mind, he has this beautiful idea that truth is an antinomy. It's something that you will never accept in an analytical perspective. Never. Truth is an antinomy. It's exactly the opposite of what an, an analytical philosopher would say. Truth is exactly the opposite of an antinomy. For instance, he's saying, let's think things around, change things. 
we are beginning with antinomies. And then, <coughs> little by little, we will get partial proof from that antinomy. We will see that it happens. It's mathematically sound. The universals, the universals for P, are in fact the antinomies. The unique and the general simultaneity. Is it possible to have the particular and the general simultaneity? Is it possible to have the antinomy and from the antinomy produce the world? We know that uh, philosophically that is a very old idea, of course, it comes from the Greeks. But uh, what is interesting is that. Uh, Mathematics has produced a lot of technical tools to give these ideas a sound understanding, completely sound understanding. So also if there is an inversion here which is interesting in the sense of the, in the idea of what. Instead of going from groups to homologies to the right functors, this is one of the great uh, terms in the I a theory article by Rotary to so show that the cohomologies are particular cases of the right functions. That this can be constructed in a million categories. That this can be constructed in multiples, etc. Then you could perhaps invert the equation. And this could be like the main basic object which is projected in all the previous layers. This changes things again because uh, topology becomes to be the center point. Like the topological spaces are the center models, not the Boolean algebras, not the classical logic, but the topological spaces. Then the intuitionistic logic associated to the topological spaces. So intuitionistic logic becomes like center, very powerful, very foundational. Let's go back to shifts uh, one moment. I will try to finish at eight so we can continue with the discussion. Shifts. So shifts are very powerful for us and are the center of all the ideas, of all the basic of the ideas. It's a very philosophical question. Phenomenology. How do you get the different phenomenon categorized in good perspectives? How do you construct universal categories? This is a question very far in philosophy from the Greek uh, philosophers until Kant, until Peirce. There is a passage between the multiplicity and the one. A very philosophical and phenomenological question. You can produce layers for this basic question. You can mathematize and try to introduce definitions for this general passage. How good do you go in mathematics from the local to the global? There are several ways of doing that. You can do that in an analytical way or in a synthetical way, and they are exactly equivalent. In shift theory, they are, they are exactly equivalent. That is something very interesting also from the point of view of methodology and the philosophy for shifts. Shifts are a very central point in which if you look analytica and analytically and if you look synthetically, they are good, there are good translations, <coughs> very good translations between the analytical approach and like the center point. The usual idea is this one, the analytical perspective. What was the what was our shift if you remember? Our shift was this this drawing. When you have the only thing that you have in a shift is the topological space on the top, the topological space on the bottom, here projection, 
which behaves well. That is, if you have a point here, you can get a small neighborhood here in order that these things are exactly the same. They are morphic. For every, for every point, you have a neighborhood in which this is exactly the same as this. And then the, the basic question is how, how do you construct the inverses of the projection? If you have a point which is covered by neighborhoods, then you have sections. And then you are asked to find out if there is a way to glue all of them together, or the local sections in a global one. So the idea is looking it in this way is purely analytical. It's a, it's a definition of the shift from an analytical perspective. You take the neighborhoods, and in the neighborhoods, you produce a covering of, this, of, the, of the space, more covering of the space. If you have good information in the intersections, then you can go do, do all of them together, and you can do the local sections in a global one. So, neighborhoods produce coverings. If the coverings cohere well in the intersections, then you can do that with them together in the upper space. That's an analytical perspective, a very simple one. But you can traduce, translate everything in a synthetic way. You can have all of this uh, spread by arrows, which I was telling yesterday. You can produce a topology. Uh, not given by neighborhoods but by arrows, and you have the translations exactly in the same way in the upper left. This part of the, of the methodology is called the pre -shift. it's a documented name, the the, the, the name the name for shift in, in French is Fesso. Fesso was the was the name by the French school from the beginning of the 60s. And uh, I think here in America, for example, at the beginning, the theory of Swiss was called the theory of Fesso. And afterwards, they found the, the, the correct name for, for Fesso, which is just uh, the sheaf of wheat in the fields. So there is a good, complete translation between analysis and synthesis. The first part corresponds just to cover. If you have a coherent covering and you can do together, then you have to see. But the first idea is just to cover. There are a lot of ways to cover a space or an object or a mathematical object. You can cover it in very different ways. The finer the covering of the object, the better mathematical information you will get. This is related to very concrete mathematical problems. Very, very concrete mathematical problems. Grotendieck did not uh, invent all his theory just to, for the sake of generality and good behavior in abstraction and good smoothness properties in the abstraction. He had a very concrete mathematical, very strong mathematical problem in mind, the veil conjectures. The veil conjectures are conjectures of uh, one of the Bulbaki members, Andre Veil, in the, in the end of the 40s, an article published here in, in America, in which he had, had a, a way of counting something extremely concrete. Take the Galois fields. The Galois fields are the finite fields. Instead of working with infinite fields, take finite fields. And in finite fields, try to mimic whatever you know. In finite fields are in very specific finite characteristics. Try to mimic there the most important mathematical construction which goes from the continuous to the discrete which is the Riemann zeta function. The Riemann zeta function is just the construction by Riemann to generalize some distribution of primes thanks to a good meromorphic function in which you can define the, the function which, uh, with, with good exponents on the real line and then you can 
extend it on the whole complex plane. plane. We were talking yesterday about analytical continuation. The, Rie the Riemann zeta function is the analytical continuation of a good function which structurally says how prime side are distributed. That becomes a function of complex analysis on characteristic zero then. But here in the fields, in the finite fields, we have finite characteristics. And how can we can we invent or can we translate the Riemann zeta function in the finite fields? That's what they did. They invented a general Riemann zeta function for finite characteristics. And he, he conjectured some properties of that Riemann zeta function. So we are saying something extremely concrete in the sense of mathematical concreteness. Uh, we are well talking with finite fields, with polynomials on finite fields, with counting the roots of polynomials on, on finite fields through the generalization of the Riemann zeta function. Something more concrete is difficult. It's extremely concrete. It's a purely calculation problem. What did Grotten did is completely extraordinary is to, show, to, to, to solve this problem producing a gigantic machinery. The gigantic machinery of what we have been talking about, the sheaves, the schemes, the topos, these three together produced the machinery to solve the very conjecture. So there is a very concrete problem behind that. That very, very important concrete problem is interesting for us methodologically and philosophically through the notion of covering. Coverings, the usual coverings, the usual coverings for algebraic objects, which were invented before Andre Weil for his conjectures by Zariski and the, the American School of Algebraic Geometry, produced a good interesting forms of topology of coverings related to algebra and to arithmetic but those topology and coverings were not very fine they were false there were too many or too many the, the open sets were too large and they were not fine enough to detect the differences okay. what what uh, Rotten did is something very special is to introduce all this general machinery to produce finer and finer topologies to finally get the solution to the problem. So, finer coverings will be interesting to solve extremely concrete and difficult mathematical problems through an abstract machinery. And at, the mo at least uh, for the moment, there is no, there has been no solution of the broken uh, of the very conjectures different at the one that the Grotten Dickens and his school provided. There hasn't been a different solution. So that solution used a strongly category, used a strongly uh, Grotten Dick topology, strongly new coverings. So new synthetical coverings have been helpful to solve a very specific mathematical problem, probably at the mid, uh, mid of the 20th century, it was the hardest problem. It was solved through this gigantic machinery. This gigantic machinery is related then to covers. To covers. How to cover mathematical objects? So there are little ways to cover objects. And the simplest one possibly are the, the Persian categories. The three person category. Firstness, secondness, and thirdness. First. Firstness is the immediate, secondness is the action and reaction, and thirdness is the mediation. The mediation is the essential way to cover an action and reaction, a polarity. If you have a polarity, then the going back and forth, you can call it a uh, connection and absorption, or a covering. Of the, of the one and the two by third, and the mediation, this would be the general structure. So, going further, 
if, you, if we take the general strategy of taking turners seriously, covering turners seriously with a lot of different techniques and approaches, we will be approaching different layers of coverings, different contexts of covering, and these differentiations will help to understand our very difficult work. But that's more or less the, the idea behind that. There are a lot of mathematics behind that. I will not insist on, on that, but simply for those who are mathematicians, look at the names. Very, very important mathematicians there, in which you have all, a lot of very important problems. From the, the basic idea of Langlands to reconstruct magnetics with differential forms, the idea of Laurier that the junctions are very well, the generalization of, uh, of, of large cardinal parcella, etc. Et we have a lot of very important, strongly difficult mathematics which consist in producing <coughs> very fine coverings for mathematical objects. The finer the covering, the better representation of the object. And if we, another good definition of mathematics would be the exact study of representation theorems. Representation theorems are everywhere. If you have good coverings, you will have good representation theorems. That's also a, a very important lead of uh, American mathematics with Marshall Stone. Let's go to the transients. Uh, a pendulum, oh, sorry, I, I will go past in this end, so we can go uh, I, I can come back to this afterwards if you want. The pendulum, the Grotendieck pendulum, between invention and discovery. For, for Gotenk, it, it was extremely important that both of them are all the time in mathematics. The mathematician is at the same time inventing and discovering. He is listening to the things. The things listen, talk to him. He was able to, to listen to strange things that were in the structure of mathematics, in that ideal structure of mathematics. But then, he, he needed to invent the languages, to invent the actions, invent the representations, to produce a sound understanding of things. So there is a sense in which you discover structures, but then you invent the languages to express that representation of the structure. Here are the actions, the logic, the language, people could be more the, the the reason and the heart. But both of them are indispensable for God. You cannot be or a realist or an idealist. You have to be both of them at the same time. You have to be a realist in the sense that there are things which are beyond us. Okay? Even if they are the ideal, they are not our invention. Our invention are the languages, the actions, representations which permit to take those structures. So there is a going a back and forth, a continuous back and forth between invention and discovery. That's very good thing. And mathematics is a constant and continuous translation. You have to translate algebraic things into arithmetic things, arithmetic things into topology. Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And you have to be all the time be translating objects. And the better the translations, the better you will get an understanding of, of the mathematical objects. So you are really in a network, constant, constant network of translations, of parts of information. You have a lot of different information, how they are related together. You attended did that very carefully, with very Good mathematical theorems applied to mathematics. It hasn't been done to take that general authentic methodology and to extrapolate it outside mathematics. Can it be done or not? I don't know. We will see. I will, I will give you some examples in the, in the 
So it's not uh, our company. But uh, this is something that should be done, not by one person, not by two, sorry, but by community, in the case, schools. But these are things that have to be done in one moment. There is a completion of the work, a completion of the ideal work. For example, a good, nice, and very, very beautiful example by Grotendieck also. Take the rationals and take the polynomials over the rationals. They will give you some roots here and here and here. Take all the roots together. It's the value of group of the algebraic closure of the rationals over the rationals. It's a very strange, very beautiful, very complex Galois group. That, one, that Galois group comes from arithmetic and algebra. The Russian mathematical school has found wonderful connections between those apparently very abstract categories and physics. So the, the very physics are up. We know that physics also is an invention, an ideal construction of the world. But it is more related in any case to the world than, than in principle it would be mathematics. Uh, people like uh, Konsevich, uh, Kohn, Cartier have found that the Galois group of the closure of the rationals over the rationals are acting on the universal constant of physics, on the Planck constant, on the, on the velocity constant of Einstein, the C constant. Etc. The, the actual uh, invariants of physics are acted on by this algebraic and arithmetic group. This is something very strange, very, very powerful. Something is going on there which we don't understand for the moment, but in which uh, the expansion of mathematics will become to be very important in, in the following decades. The pendulum. I will insist that on that briefly because I said that I, will, I do not want to be either analytic or either synthetic. It's important to be both at the same time. But it changes completely the perspective. The, the, there are people now, for example, like Jean Petit, this great uh, mathematician and philosopher and mathematician, French, uh, which is has been working in the, in the last 20 years on the neurogeometry of the brain. He's saying, and he's trying to, to discover that there is a, an initial neurogeometry in the brain, which, is, which should be initial, and afterwards, well afterwards, will come the language. Well afterwards will come the linguistic. Well afterwards will come the words. But there is a proto-geometry which is before, which comes before. The language. So there is an inversion, which is also a very interesting Grotendieck inversion. Language would not be the first thing, it would be very well ahead. So there should be like a pendulum going back and forth, like this pendulum here that you have here. This is an articulated pendulum in which you have here and a stick, here and another stick. You, send, you, you, you throw this stick to this side and the other one to the other side, it produces this pendulum, which is called the articulated pendulum. This is a chronophotograph by Edmond Gilmare, a photographer of the beginning of the 20th century. What is interesting is that if you have this and this, and then you have an opposition one way and the other way, it produces the curves of light. If you have the progress of light produced by the opposition, the negation going one to one side and the other side. Two names only, and uh, I will uh, go forward this this view and satellite. In general, I think that the French school in mathematics, in philosophy of mathematics, have been very, very interesting, very important not very well known for Fortunati. By, by only, I mean, power and reasons, 
there is uh, one uh, language in the world, which is the English, which is very important. It's, uh, it's uh, invading everywhere. But French uh, is, is, a, is a way of thinking, which is in general different. French people think differently. And they think very, very intensely and very nicely. Rotten, of course, but also the philosophers of mathematics. But you probably you know him. Satellite is less well known, but he's a beautiful thinker of, uh, of modern mathematics. They are people who have talked uh, like uh, 20 uh, years ago about this idea of producing a philosophy of mathematics more akin to real mathematics, more akin to transits, to changes in mathematics to all these kind of dynamics, which is behind what I am saying. Okay. These are names that we should study a little further. So finishing quickly, you know very well the, like the, the objectives of one moment of the 20th century, some of the ideas of postmodernism, particularly important, the differentiation and the conjugation of opposites, the death of universals. These things shouldn't be like that. There should be also a pendulum, the, the counterpart. There should be a differentiation and integration. This is exactly the pragmatic match. Okay? You differentiate the sign and then you integrate the sign. This is exactly the category theoretic perspective. You have concrete regions which are integrated in the universal definition. Instead of having a conjugation of opposites, you should conjugate when you have coherences. Now, you cannot conjugate everything. You can conjugate coherences. So the shift is a more interesting uh, idea there. You cannot say uh, whatever you want. There are things which are impossible to say. But there are things which can cohere well. If they, if they cohere well, you can talk about them. You can have a coherence with them. I talked already about the relative universe. So, in the trans perspective, against the post perspective, there should be like a complementation of knowledge, a complementation of culture. We should not be on one side only, we should be at least on the pendulum, and in fact, what is interesting is not just to be analytical or to be synthetic. What is important is to be in the middle, to cover the middle. How do you cover the middle between the analytic perspective and the synthetic perspective? With fine coverings. This is my day, we will be coming into that in very concrete examples in the Bologna roots. How do you cover? the polarities. You can do that in principle. This is what we will be doing then. Try to cover <coughs> like the beginning, or at least for me the, 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 the great uh, thinker of modernity, which is Novak. The great poet, the great thinker, is uh, and the mind on general encyclopedia of thought. I will be bringing it here with a lot of citations. The general understanding of the contemporary world thought already 200 years ago. And I am certain that Novalis is more contemporary for us than the, and a lot of thinkers of today. I will try to prove that. We will put in one side one one item. We will try to put on one side the values. On the other side, side data of transformation, two hundred years. Yeah. It's a beautiful work by the Czech school to pro to try to provide a cartography of our. I told you, it's a beautiful work. I will go deeper on that. We will go deep on Novalis and deep on 
and check the score. And we will try to profit from the one, two, three, four rotating ideas. The shifts, the schemes, the topos, and the motives. To try to produce for this convergence here a, a good web, a good network. We will, produce, we will try to produce a good network where there is enough coherence and enough covering here to pass from Paris to Corrupts, to Florensky, to Vital, to Valerie, to Mazzola, from Barbu, to Giro. I think there are a lot of beautiful connections there. These beautiful connections are essentially fine quality. And this is a big kind of idea. This is what uh, I will try to do in the, in the following. Use the machinery to produce a sound problem between very geometrical ideas, because at the, at the bottom, Grotendik is a very geometer, very geometrical ideas, which can be seen at uh, in the beginning of modernity, at the height of modernity, all of these are in, in the beginning of the 20th century, first Lorenzi, Valerie, Valdo. And the people, the young people that are inventing today of the world, we will be happy enough to have all of them in our final round table. I, I can inform you that now all of this will be here. We will be wonderful. So that's more or less where, where we are heading to use uh, the relatively general stratification of knowledge to show that in fact we have been always transformed. From the rise to today, always that model. So we can have a little time for questions if you want to. Yes, please. And you said it yourself, I think the fundamental question is doesn't get invented all this to solve a specific problem, right? So what is the problem? What is the problem? What is, is your problem? Ah, what, is what is my problem? My, are you available? Well, my, my conjecture is that, in fact, uh, I was uh, saying it uh, simply at the beginning, that uh, we have to change our paradigms. We have to change, uh, well, it has been done already, but we have to, to inform it uh, and uh, produce it a better structure. Postmodernism is well is well better. Postmodernism was an important moment, but uh, it has had, it has been a set theory overrated. Overrated postmodernism everywhere. You can say whatever you want. Okay. Yes, and uh, it has been saturated. That's a very good word. Excellent. Uh, there are there have been saturations. The analytic trend has been saturated. The postmodern way has been saturated. So we have to work on other perspectives. So the other perspectives are here more or less clear. What I am saying is that those other perspectives can be more or less well structured using growth and this idea. That's my hypothesis. And my hypothesis is that as uh, there was a time where uh, Plato used the, the Greek mathematics to produce a great, great philosophy, when there was a time of uh, differential calculus used by Linus to produce a great philosophy, there should be, there hasn't been yet, there should be a great philosopher in the next 20, 30 years, which will use Rothendieck to produce a completely new understanding of the world. That's the idea. And just what I am saying is posing the idea, posing the problem. The problem is that who will be there, who will be doing it, 
after 10 years, very young people like you all. <laughs> I don't know if this would be, I don't know if this would be a sort of thing that you find for us, but it seems like we went to that with saturation of postmodernism. Yeah. It seems like there's kind of become a dearth of evaluation of being able to kind of come more of arts background specifically themselves. Contemporary art is spoken about value and it's very much kind of turned, talked about in these very subjectivist terms. There is no real way to derive any sort of evaluation of the type of things that are being made other than kind of to the recourse to the market. Okay, this becomes a sort of insular thing on that providing value. But it seems like to be able to provide some sort of different sort of form of standard criticism, some sort of constraints on what we can say. Something quite wise. Yes, 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 yes. I, I agree completely. And, and uh, this is what uh, Giro and uh, his last bed uh, movement are trying to specifically. They are trying to produce a new art theory in which uh, values are multiple but not arbitrary. There is a sound organization of the multiplication of values in art in which uh, the multiplication is extremely important because then you have diversity, but uh, you cannot say whatever you want. There are artworks which are certainly more important than others. That is something that is uh, like anathema for the postmodernism. You cannot say that there is a hierarchy. There is a great artwork and a lesser artwork. For them, they are equivalent and this is the liberty and the freedom of invention. But in fact, uh, that, is, uh, that produces a saturation of, of the identity of values and things like that. So young people like you know, and the Gazelle and also the guy standing and people are trying to, to get some kind of, uh, of a framework, of a network of values in which uh, you can have all this multiplicity but you have also some kind of a structure in the multiplicity. That is very important. And uh, if it can be done uh, using Gertrude's uh, ideas, I think it can be done. That would be one leap. It's very much uh, in the perspective of, of a lot of leaps. Would you say that it's sort of a problem of trying to improve yourself from the post modern situation and being obsessed with that? It is not really trying to attack is a is a form of a way of like simulating, producing a simulation of complete detective itself. And that this is something that is not reserved specifically for, for either a philosophical or scientific or, or artistic perspective, but in fact those hierarchies don't necessarily exist because they're interchangeable. Yeah. You say the perfect thing. Um so I, I think what you've drawn here is in a way like there is a problem of integration. Yeah. So, so in, in a way, what I um, could be like possibly be like <coughs> kind of like a uh, synthesis in the real sense of that, uh, like, uh, like a meta, meta philosophy, um, or like an integration. There should there should be a metaphysical In fact, the, 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 the analytical perspective would 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 would. would uh, try to go more to the differentiation and the synthetic philosophy more to the integration, but in fact, behind the two of them, there should be a metaphysical which integrates both perspectives. That would be very nice. It hasn't been totally <coughs> because even the balance hasn't been explicitly stated very well. There, there hasn't been this polite very well stated in order to produce the metaphysical. Yeah. But, but that should be one of the important things in the future, yes. Okay. It's possible to like touch on uh, the 
that. Yes. Yeah. We will do that in the next two weeks. Yeah. Uh, first, uh, then uh, Christopher. So, um, for the program for the following weeks, you're focusing on putting these kind of ideas and seeking by an energy to, uh, to now transpose this uh, inactivity in mathematics as uh, original point of view on Joker. Yes. But at the same time, you're discussing the, the, the mathematical part, you also pointed out the fact that what is typically called philosophy of mathematics is really philosophy of foundations of mathematics. Yes. In that brilliant mathematics are largely ignored. So you, you pointed to the fact that there is something missing, that there is an actual philosophy of mathematics to be done. Yes. Which is a, a second part of what is a, a separate program to work. About the analogy in the complete and so on. So on. So these are two different programs. Yes. And on the side of philosophy of real mathematics, how do you do a okay. sketch of a program? Yes, yes, that, 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 that's one thing that I can say I have done. <laughs> but it, 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 that's, a, that's my book. My book on the synthetic philosophy of contemporary mathematics. I, I, will not, I, part, I, mean, <laughs> I will not try to resume it here. Yes, in the okay. okay, but uh, I tried to do that uh, to, to produce like the beginning also of, of, uh, of a different philosophy of mathematics, going to the to the real structures of mathematics and to see what were the the problems there. And there are a lot of problems uh, in the book that uh, are not the usual problems that you find in the, the books of uh, philosophy, analytical philosophy of mathematics. I will not do it here because it will take us uh, away, but uh, that's uh, completely correct. Uh, you, are, you are taking it perfectly there. At least two different, and in fact, there will be a lot of things uh, happening uh, around. This is the, the question on, of how to do real philosophy of mathematics. This has been done uh, by several people uh, from, from the 60s until, until now. And uh, now, in particular, the, has been founded a, a philosophy or an association of uh, mathematical practice in philosophy. So there is a group of people who are uh, thinking about uh, how real mathematics works and what are the real problems, etc. The association for uh, philosophy of mathematical practice, I think, or something like that. I, if you write me, I will give you the exact name. But, uh, it's, a, it's an association which is working uh, specifically as a group uh, since five years or so, but uh, they come from people who did uh, work on uh, philosophy of the human, philosophy of the law, philosophy of the uh, yeah, strong monographs on them. That's one way. In that way, uh, one little uh, approach of mine is my synthetic philosophy of contemporary this is a whole different problem, as you say. This is completely different. And I think no one has ever think about this. This is completely different. Yeah, I have a question because early on you, you had uh, the postmodernism linked up with uh, analytic philosophy uh, and its emphasis or overemphasis on logic and sort of reduction of mathematics to logic. And, and I found that really curious because uh, generally speaking I tend to think of analytic philosophy and logicism as a sort of modern school, right? Uh, and I think it's, it's even in uh, your uh, synthetic philosophy book where you speak it as a, at least modern mathematics as opposed to contemporary mathematics. Uh, and so when you had postmodernism linked up together with what seemed to me to be a, a very much a modernist movement, I was a bit surprised. Um, and, and some of your critiques of postmodernism and sort of extreme relativism that go with that uh, don't also sort of hit me as what I tend to think of as postmodernism so much as a sort of late modernism. Uh, and, and you know, this is a term which I, I guess I've encountered in architecture and literary studies uh, as sort of this moment where you know, sort of you look at the works of Samuel Beckett and the sort of absolute exhaustion of any potential for meaning making 
or even, I would say the early works of Derrida, where a deconstruction leads to a, a skepticism of sorts. Uh, but there are many post-structuralists, certainly, that I don't think are part of relativists, that uh, certainly, I mean, whether or not one considers them post-modern, I mean, figures such as the and Guattari, uh, but also the way in which they use purse, the way in which white is being used today really never fit into any of those categories. Uh, you know, I think even complex systems theory, which is for me a, a source of inspiration. Uh, I think there are many paradigms today that are available that are trying to find something between a pure relativism and a pure absolutism that perhaps aren't either uh, the sort of relativism that I tend to associate with late modernism or its flip side being this, you know, real emphasis on foundations that you see inside the Hilbert program uh, and that sort of thing. So I'm wondering about why you put postmodernism and analytic philosophy together. No, that, okay. it, it, that's from you. You're, thank you very much for your comment because that's something that I didn't want to do. I, mm -hmm. I put on one side, on one side, uh, analytic philosophy and the postmodernism to get to the counterpart. But I didn't link them together. Okay. Analytic philosophy and postmodernity, they go here, parallel or counterparts, but they are not linked. Mm -hmm. I, I, would, I won't say they are linked, but I completely so agree with you. Like that transpondernism is the opposite to that binary. Yeah. Ah, okay, yeah. that makes total sense. Okay, okay, thank you. Yeah, I, would, I guess kind of following up on that, um, like I just wanted to clarify, because to me it does seem like, especially with kinds of like, maybe an early Derrida reading or something where you're like very likely to say that a lot of things are completely specific and relative. Um, it seems like what you're talking about at the very end of taking all of these small sections and gluing them together as uh, you're talking about how there is a larger truth that you can compose out of the relative truths. That, that seemed very sheaf-like to me. And you're kind of saying that transmodernism would be a uh, uh, um, it almost sounded like it was being opposed to postmodernism, but in a lot of ways, to me, it seems like it's almost like attempting to save the good parts of postmodernism, <laughs> the locality of postmodernism. But when you have all these different local ideas, you can find if they intersect the right way, you can glue these local things to, to create larger structures. And so it allows the local uh, specific ideas, relative ideas, to exist and then to glue them. And I just wanted to clarify this. See if yeah. I was seeing that. Right. Absolutely correct. And that yeah, is it is, yeah. that is that is my basic idea. And what what you are getting uh, right in explicit and perfect way is that what what I am doing is to apply the shift concept to the different approaches, cultural approaches. The different cultural approaches sometimes are polar and they cannot survive. In enter in a dialogue. But when they can enter in a dialogue, they produce a coherence, <coughs> and then you can put them together. That's the perfect, the perfect understanding of this. What we are doing is to apply the shift concept to the different polarities in culture. Is that possible or not? I don't know. We will see. <laughs> Please uh, here. There. Uh, okay, so maybe related. Uh, but I'm, I'm curious about, this. you pass over the French sort of area, but you know, but you didn't show that. But what I'm curious about is, is in, is in your, your philosophy, your philosophy what, what sort of, or what's, what is your relationship to say French rationalism? Because I think that you can trace these sort of lines that you take over up and like, within mathematics and can within philosophy from figures like, like Bachelard and Hang. I'm wondering if your, your, your Approach to philosophy is informed by the, the sort of methodological inheritance. That you get completely, in completely influenced. I, I I accept that influence completely. I am completely from the French uh, philosophy of mathematics from the very beginning. In fact, from uh, Lodman, which is even behind them. Uh, Lodman is for me like the, the greatest uh, example of a philosopher of mathematics. We did very strong mathematical, real uh, studies, and then we did uh, try to do a philosophy on that. So on Lodman I have worked a lot, in fact I have translated the whole uh, Lodman work to Spanish 
this, my translation to Spanish is much uh, more uh, complete than the French uh, originals. I, I discovered new manuscripts by the man. So I have worked a lot on, on the French tradition and mathematics, and I am uh, uh, grown up in this tradition by my own readings. I didn't do that uh, in the academics. Okay? In the academics, I was just a mathematician for a very long time until I was like uh, 30 years and in that time I, I, I saw that the world existed in you know, mathematics and I began to, to think about the world. But uh, the, the Lohmann tradition has been very important, can be um, like all of them, Cavaliers, uh, they are all behind of all, all of these things. These are like the, the, the iceberg, uh, Top of the top of the iceberg, but they are behind all of them, and they are very, very important. In fact, uh, here we had London here, which is Lodman. These are the, the lenses of Lodman, which uh, help us to, uh, to see things that usually we don't see. He, he was a very interesting person, in which you see the, the term saturation, which uh, you saturate mathematics, and uh, when you get enough saturations, then you have covered your object well. And you have covered it, that will give you a good representation theorem and a good understanding. And then you have to change. Then you have to change the category, or then you have to change the way of representing, or the way of copying. That's always my, the, the, the basic idea of, the, of, this, uh, of these perspectives. You have to cover. You have to cover all this. You have to cover all this with wood and nice ways of work. Good network here. It produces the problem. The finer the network, the better for the understanding. That's what Luzman said a lot of times. You saturate the object, and when the object is well saturated, you get one of the wood perspectives, but when it is saturated, that's it for that perspective. Then you have to change. Change the perspective, saturate with the, that perspective. It is done, change the perspective, saturate again. That will give you a good understanding. If you take all different saturations, like in a shift light perspective, and you try to move, move them together, then perhaps you will be understanding something. But more um, this is a, a very naive level of conversation. Right? It seems to me that they're talking about, we're talking about using this kind of language to describe what's happening in the world of thought and so on. I thought, originally, I thought what they wanted was for these mathematical ways of thinking to, to be actually used by the practitioners of and action in the world itself, yeah. as opposed to being just used to describe it, yes. right? Um, and I wonder, because <coughs> phys physicists most recently have been are aware and acknowledge the importance, the unexpected importance of mathematical conclusions for the effect on their actual thinking, right? But they haven't thereby Taken up the mathematical ways of seeing to move their own project forward, even in view of that, correct? Uh, I think that they are changing also. Yeah, there, is a, there is a strong uh, theoretical revolution in physics in which uh, Grothendieck is being applied already. In the, physics. In physics. Yes. Are yes. By, in, physicists. by physicists, and, yes, and, and, and particularly in the in the new new perspectives of foundations of me, uh, quantum mechanics, yeah. there are toposes of good model toposes for quantum me mechanics. This is very strongly researched now. Okay, so that same speech or whatever, right, from that physics, are you suggesting that the application of the same concept? In, in, in I, I hope so, Would yes. So. By the practitioners, not just from what they describe. Yes, I hope so. That, that should change things. Yes. Okay. Um, 
Um, it's not good jumping ahead and also related to that, but uh, uh, do, you, like, do you think that you'll make the claim that, that um, culture uh, is, or whatever aspect of culture you're talking about, is well defined enough to be um, theorized about um, in like a way that's actually ontological, not, or versus like versus using these concepts as metaphors? Yes, yeah, sir. No, no. The the, the well de, the well defined is is very hard to come about. Yeah. And uh, we will have uh, enough vagueness. Uh, the vagueness will be always very important. Uh, and I hope we will not get to good definitions, well defined, well defined things. Yeah. Things are vague enough, and it's important that they are vague. That they remain vague. And then afterwards, if you represent them in context. Then you can be a little less away and you continue in that perfect. But uh, it's, uh, it seems the history of culture says so that you will never get the final good definition. Yeah. That was one of the, of the ideas of the analytic philosophy, which was just impossible. You cannot get to a final definition. You know, I have a question that touches on politics, which on the surface would be as far from this as one can imagine, but I think this is where you're going with it, uh, is real-world applications that go beyond design, per se, that go to concrete manifestations. Uh, and so, on the one hand, I'm thinking in terms of the irreducibility, the mutual irreducibility of one and the many. And this is something that you see in terms of political organizing. It's not something that happens nearly at the philosophical level, the economical level, but in terms of how do you produce uh, sort of Gramscian coalitions uh, that can actually produce change in a social situation. And some would argue uh, that you have to do this, you know, say Habermas argues that, you know, you have to develop ways that different competing groups will be able to speak a common language so they can organize together to bring about counter, I mean, he doesn't use the term counter hegemonic groups, but I'm thinking Ernesto Laclaude, right? That there has to be a common language if you're going to produce coalitions that can mobilize enough portions of society to bring about social change. Whereas someone like Foucault, famously in his disagreements with Habermas, or someone like Yotar would say, no, it's the difference. You will never be able to develop a common language that fully encompasses difference. Um, and so it, it makes me to think of something like queer politics, for example. Uh, you know, some people have said, well, you we need an LGBT organizing political structure uh, that's going to bring together diverse groups of people who are sexually different. But then if you have queer politics, it is open to the future. It is open to a difference which can never be subsumed within the universal. Uh, and so when you're speaking of saturations and colorings, I'm wondering how is it possible to develop relative universals that are not closed in a certain sense, that allow for something like um, the novel, to not be covered over completely in a way that allows for the potentiality for change. Uh, and I guess if we're going to be listening for a second, that allows for the actual not to subsume the virtual, even as you're building relative universes that allow for concrete political action that say could speak back to hegemonic social structures. Well, I, I don't really know how to do that, but uh, <laughs> certainly you will do. <laughs> <laughs> You are you are the person who are, who are going to explain that to us. Okay. Um, okay. <laughs> you are you are the one, Christopher. Well, this is where my brain's going. I, I'm curious. I guess I, I, does the covering always have to be complete? And if no, it is no. Is no. there a danger there? Yes, there is a danger. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Yes, there is a great danger, particularly when you apply it outside mathematics. Mm -hmm. In mathematics, you, 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 are, you, are, you don't have any kind of those problems. But if you try to be complete or to try to be saturated <laughs> in the context, then you will uh, explain freedom. That is the problem. Because if you were talking about in contemporary well, SPCM, uh, Synthetic Philosophy of Contemporary Mathematics, about the way in which if you do try to go for any sort of absolutistic closure, you get the self-referential effects of sort of the Delian um, paradox. Mm -hmm. And is that what you're getting at here? Yes, that, that would be one. Okay. But, but certainly, I, I am, 
I am uh, truth in saying that you are the one that is going to spend to, to ask that in the future. Uh, because uh, that, 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 that goes well beyond my expertise. Uh, I, I have the feeling of some kind of uh, political activity in my family, in my tradition, but I have, I have never thought about that. I have like, family has been also been very active in, politi in politics, but uh, I am not a thinker about politics, you are. And probably you will have to use many of these things to advance in that. Right on for today. Thank you very much. Yes. Uh,